Well, thank you very much for this invitation from Essamon. It's great to be back in my former home in Southern California, Los Angeles. It's good to see old friends and old faces. Thank you to KPFK and KJLH for helping to bring you all out here this evening. And I'm going to speak about these two books, as was just suggested, but I also feel com compelled to make an apology uh, to begin with. Uh, when the uh, former West German leader, uh, Willy Brandt, went to Poland about four decades ago, he was just so overcome with grief about what the Germans had done to Poland during <laughs> World War II. It's that he fell down on his knees and apologized to the Polish people. And I feel compelled to apologize to the indigenous people who formerly occupied Southern California and were ousted and subjected to genocide. I feel compelled to apologize to the people of African descent who were murdered and enslaved and all the people who were subjected to atrocities and depredations. And at the end of the day, there are those who still believe that the process which led to this genocide and, and this enslavement was a step forward for humanity because it could create the United States of America. And it's not surprising that given that so many people feel that it was justifiable and worthwhile to have a genocide and enslavement to create this alleged great country, it's not surprising that therefore we have a, a great deal of reactionary sentiment in this body politic which was just expressed this past Tuesday. So I'm, I'm apologizing on behalf of black scholars who I think could have written a book like this years or decades ago. I'm apologizing on behalf of radical scholars who should have done this sort of work uh, decades ago. And I hope you accept my apology on behalf of the many thousands gone, the many millions gone uh, who have suffered, uh, not least because of the atrocities committed by the United States of America. So having said that, let me move on to first of all talk about the, this book. This is a book that seeks to tell a new story uh, about the origins of the United States of America. It seeks to puncture the creation myth about the United States of America and its creation. It tends to argue that the creation of the United States of America was not a great leap forward for humanity. It was certainly a great leap forward for white supremacy. There's no doubt about that. I cannot deny that there were countless Europeans, in particular, who benefited from the creation of the United States of America. But given the fact that after the creation of the United States of America in 1776, you had the United States move into the leadership of the African slave trade, ousting their alleged and ostensible colonial oppressor, I'm speaking of Great Britain, which theretofore had been leading the African slave trade. As a result of the formation of the United States, Britain is ousted <laughs> from leading the African slave trade and moves towards abolition of slavery, whereas the United States, the supposed paragon of liberty and democracy, moves into the leadership of the African slave trade. And as I suggest in this book on Cuba, uh, one of the reasons you have so many people of African descent in Cuba is because of the manic energy of US slave dealers. And as I suggest in another book that's back on the shelf about the African slave trade to Brazil, the deepest south, the United States, Brazil, and the African slave trade, one of the many reasons, oh, he's holding it up. One of the many reasons why you have so many people of African descent in Brazil more than any other country uh, outside of Nigeria is because of the manic energy of these US slave traders when the 1830s and 1840s in particular descended upon Africa and manacled and handcuffed every African in sight and drugged them across the Atlantic to Brazil. Now, the short thesis of this book is that the rebels who formed the United States of America, leading to the Declaration of Independence on July 4th, 1776, that they rebelled against British rule because they felt and suspected that Britain was moving towards abolition of slavery which would have jeopardized the fortunes of the murderer's row of founding fathers, including George Washington, Thomas Jefferson, Patrick Henry, James Madison, et al. A footnote, you, I'm sure you know that 
after the formation of the United States of America, a disproportionate percentage of the U.S. presidents were slave owners. Oh, thank you. <laughs> the short thesis of this book is that June 1772, you had Somerset's case in London, England, uh, which involved an effort to send an enslaved African man back to North America uh, after he had escaped to freedom. And uh, the judge ruled, which is represented, of course, in the movie, uh, Bell. Anybody see Bell? Yes, that's a good movie. Yeah. I like that. <laughs> okay. Uh, Lord Mansfield, the judge, in uh, Somerset's case, ruled that uh, slavery would not obtain in England. The way the law works, of course, is that even though the case did not speak specifically and pointedly to the colonies, uh, it did not take an oracle or a seer to suspect that that case would form a precedent that then would be applied to the North American colonies, thereby jeopardizing many fortunes. And as I will suggest momentarily, and as I explain at length in this book, uh, there was good reason for the so-called rebels to believe that Somerset's case would be used as a precedent in North America, thereby jeopardizing many fortunes based on the African slave trade. And rather than wait for the other shoe to fall, uh, they revolted against the British rule and established the United States of America pursuant to the Declaration of Independence, July 4, 1776. Now, that's the, the short thesis uh, of this book. A longer explanation would go back to another revolution, the so-called Glorious Revolution in England in 1688. That is to say that in 1688, the rising merchant class uh, rose up against the monarchy and clipped the wings of the king. And among other things, what this led to was the erosion of the monopoly of the Royal African Company, which theretofore had been in charge of the African slave trade. Uh, what ensues, as I talk about in the early chapters of this book, is what I call free trade in Africans. That is to say, there's a deregulation of the African slave trade. That is to say that uh, merchants are allowed to enter the African slave trade, which they do in profusion. And as was their wont, they descend upon West Africa in particular with the manic energy of crazed bees, manacling and handcuffing every African in sight, uh, dragging these Africans across the Atlantic, particularly to the Caribbean. Because as you may know, up until about the middle of the 18th century, uh, London felt that the Caribbean was more valuable than the North American mainland, not least because the Caribbean, of course, had many sugar plantations. And sugar was not only used to sweeten tea, it was also seen as something of a miracle drug, believe it or not. This <laughs> and uh, the Jamaica, Antigua, uh, Barbados in particular, uh, were the major sites for profitability at that particular time. Now, the deregulation of the African slave trade and the onset of the era of free trade in Africans leads to predictable results. One result is immense profitability. Uh, you may know that the African slave trade was one of the most profitable enterprises in the history of humankind, which is one of the reasons why it lasted for hundreds of years and why it has been so difficult to erase the aftermath that still haunts us in 2014. That is to say that some of the profits of these voyages could amount to 1,700%. That is to say you invest $1 and get $1,700 back. Now, I'm sure many of you have lived in the United States long enough to know that uh, there are those who would sell their firstborn child for a 1,700% profit, let alone some African they knew nothing about and did not know. So with the onset of free trade in Africans and deregulation of the African slave trade, you had a tremendous increase in the number of Africans brought across the Atlantic. We're talking about the late 1600s, the early 1700s. Uh, 